American-made P-39 and P-63 fighter planes for the Russian Air Force, lined up at Ladd Field, Fairbanks, Alaska, on their 2,000-mile route from United States factories to Siberia. American and Russian mechanics checked the planes before the 500-mile hop across the Bering Sea. Russian flyers now take over. They are briefed before setting out. Ready for the takeoff, more than 5,000 Lend-Lease aircraft have flown this Allied route to Russia. Planes and more planes head for Russia's eastern front via Alaska and Siberia. On patrol in the Arctic off Greenland, the United States Coast Guard cutter moves through bleak, iceberg-infested waters. She is one of four cutters on a two-month mission to smash German fortified radio bases on the remote Greenland coasts. A scout plane reports a Nazi armed trawler. Prisoners from the sinking trawler come over in small boats. Their career as radio outpost men is now over. On Little Kaldui Island off Greenland, Coast Guardsmen and soldiers capture this stockpile of German radio supplies and arms. This is one of three posts the Nazis had attempted to operate and which were supplied and reinforced in secrecy in the vast no man's land of the Arctic. The work of the Allies' Greenland patrols interrupts the Nazis' plans. signs United Nations Pact. Secretary of State Statinius addresses the assembly. It is a significant manifestation of the growing strength of the United Nations that we should mark today the third anniversary of the declaration by United Nations by receiving the signature on behalf of France of His Excellency Ambassador Henri Bonnet. France was one of the first nations to challenge the Nazi aggressors through four years of German oppression, the French people maintained their heroic resistance behind the enemy lines, the members of the resistance movement, and the soldiers of the reborn French army contributed in a vital measure to the successful liberation of their homeland by our allied armies. They rode in blood and sacrifice another glorious chapter in France's record of devotion to liberty. The nations signatory to the Declaration by United Nations welcome the formal adherence of France to this compact. We have much still to do and many difficulties still to overcome, both in the winning of the war and in the winning of the peace. In making the peace, as in waging the war to final victory over our enemies, the United Nations will be stronger because France is herself again. The signature which Ambassador Henri Bonnet will affix to this declaration of the United Nations is symbolic of her full partnership in that great enterprise. It is now my great honor, ladies and gentlemen, to present to you His Excellency, the Ambassador of France. Mr. Right. Secretary, ladies and gentlemen of the United Nations, the will expressed in the Declaration of the United Nations to end this war by a total victory over the enemy and 
to devote all national resources to the defense of the sacred rights of man and to the people's freedom is the will of France. I feel strongly that in signing this declaration in her name, I am true to her dearest and firmest aspirations. Ambassador Bonnet, in the presence of representatives of the United Nations, signs for France. The great French Republic is welcomed into the company of the United Nations. of Pacific battle, the great armada of warships, troop ships, landing ships that brought the American 6th Army to the Philippines. Surprise landings at Ormoc split the Japanese forces on Leyte Island, and a great new amphibious force strikes suddenly at Mindoro Island, 600 miles away. The Philippines campaign, after a stubborn start, bursts into widespread action. of equipment on the beach at Leyte, the raw stuff of victory. In bitter fighting, the whole island of Leyte is now liberated. center in San Francisco in the United States, blood is donated for overseas shipment in whole form for the first time. Chilled and treated so as to preserve efficiency as long as three weeks, the whole blood is packed in portable refrigerators. In daily flights, 6,500 miles across the Pacific to Leyte, the Navy's air transport service carries the blood to the wounded. Whole blood, carrying the oxygen lacking in blood plasma, goes from the West Coast donor to the casualty on Leyte in only 48 hours. A life-saving cargo for the troops in the Pacific. Today, on road after road throughout the Philippines, foot soldiers and heavy battle equipment push on for the tough fighting ahead. In village after village, the people of the Philippines return to begin free life again. The hungry are fed, the sick are cared for. The first of 12 million Filipinos are restored to liberty. Schools burned by the retreating Japanese are rehabilitated. The enemy, attempting to wipe out free education in the Philippines, burns school books too. These volumes, hidden by Filipino teachers, will once more be put to use. Leyte's young people come back to school, despite lack of space and still frequent enemy bombings. Classes in both private and public schools are resumed. In the growing areas of the Philippines that have been wrenched from Japanese rule, life begins anew.